Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this afternoon's Digital Communities Lab webinar. This is the final Digital Communities Lab webinar in the series of five sessions that we had during 2022. Um, at the end of the webinar, I'll point you out where we can actually watch the previous sessions online if you're interested in catching up on them. Um, before we start, I'd like to mention that I live and work on the lands of the Ghana people, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to them as the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we're gathering on virtually today. I acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship to the Ghana people country and respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. This webinar is online and we definitely at least already have one person in the room who is coming to us from a different part of Australia. Um, so I extend that respect to relevant communities and other regions and especially welcome many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. Um, the University Library has, this is the end of the second year of the Digital Humanities Lab webinar series. And we created this series to inspire and inform humanities researchers and their potential collaborators who are interested in using digital approaches in, the work, in their work. These sessions have been attended by students, researchers, um, people from the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums sector, people from the sciences, we allow them into, and we, we've had a really great um, selection of speakers and attendees through this program. I uh, thank you for joining us today. A couple of bits of housekeeping. Today's session will be recorded and shared after the event on the University of Adelaide YouTube page. Um, we will have all of our presenters first today and then bring them back for questions and discussion at the end. If you do have any questions, um, please enter them in the chat window. If you've attended last, the last webinar where I forgot to turn the chat on, you will hopefully be reassured that the chat is working for everyone today. If you'd like to reassure me by introducing yourself in the chat, then <laughs> please feel free to do so. Um, so they, they can be sent through at any time during today's webinar and I will pose the questions to our speakers at the end. So today we're talking about using digitised and digital collections. This can be museum collections, university collections, archival collections, library, art collections, any of those kinds of things, and especially when they're joined together. Um, we're also touching on digital collections like those that tell the story of weather, of land use and of place. Um, an increasing availability of digital collections and increasing accessibility of the tools to use them is opening up new opportunities for digital storytelling or putting historical collections to completely new uses. Um, so I won't introduce much further, I'll let these speakers speak for themselves. And first up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sophia Sampakaro, a lecturer and researcher in archaeology at the Australian National University. Her research addresses the study of human subsist subsistence strategies through the analysis of fauna assemblages mainly on Pleistocene and early Holocene periods. She has a research interest in applying taphonomic criteria and methods to studying faunal assemblages to determine to discern between non-human predators and human-generated accumulations. Among other projects, she's involved in Professor Sue O'Connor's ARC Laureate project from Sunda to Sahul, understanding modern human dispersal adaptation and behaviour en route to Australia. And with that, I'm going to turn my camera off and we will welcome Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. And Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. If not, please let us know somehow. And I hope you are seeing the screen properly. So first of all, I would like to say, um, today I'm talking from Nanawal land, and I would like to pay my respect to all the traditional owners, past, present, and emerging, and all the traditional owners of all the lands from where all of you are joining today. So I will say start my presentation by saying Yuma, that is, how we say hello in Nanawal language. And as I was saying, as Alexis was saying, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Australian National University. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a project called Skullbook. That is this project that we, with the subtitle of creating a bond library to support student learning and teaching. So the Skullbook project began with a question that was, how can we improve the access of mainly students, but also researchers, to the rich collection of skeletal remains that is hosted at the School of Archaeology and Anthropology at the ANU? So as you might see or can see on the images on the right, most of these specimens are either locked into cabinets that you need to key especially to own, or somebody had this brilliant idea of hanging them on the wall, like hand trophies, that is a bit creepy. But as you can see, the access to the specimens is not something easy, right? So we had that issue. We were trying to, to sort out how, how we could solve this. Currently, the only, well, I would say until 
probably four years ago, the only way you could access these specimens was by talking to a faculty member or having an HDR student with you while you were handing the specimen. So of course, for undergraduate and postgraduate students, that could be a bit of a, of a, of a hassle to, to be able to access these specimens. Another issue we had is that some of these specimens are quite fragile, or they are what we call holotypes. So they are unique specimens. As and I, This is a bit of a teaser. We have, for example, a thylacine skeleton. That's something that obviously you don't want it to get damaged, because well, it would be a bit of a tragedy and probably I will get fired if, if I damage that skeleton. To make things even more exciting or complex, there wasn't really a functional compilation of specimens in the form of an online or, or digital or physical catalog of these specimens. So we started discussing what we could do with this collection and how could we improve access and kind of enhance, enhance the collection itself. And the first thing we had to think about is how are we gonna get funds? How are we gonna get money to do this? So we were looking around and we found this A new Vice Chancellor Teaching Enhancement Grant that the idea of this grant is to support education projects. So to support innovative and creative initiatives that will improve a student's experience and teaching and learning, and also the coursework that undergraduate and postgraduate students will do and how they learn. So luckily enough, we got awarded one of these teaching enhancement grants in 2017, and it ran, so the Scalbook project ran from 2017 to 2018 officially. And this project comprised the collaboration, the active collaboration between archaeology and digital humanities faculties, faculty, as well as the essential contribution of our amazing research assistant, Renee, that I will talk a lot about her in a bit. Each of our team members, each of us, had different responsibilities related to this creation, but also the evaluation of the 3D models that we were generating. So for example, I'm a zoo archaeologist, so I do animal bones. So I was the one in charge of looking at the models and see if they were kind of scientifically accurate and if they would be useful for researchers. Terry and Katrina were digital humanities specialists, were the ones with like the brains on the project, right? And all the bits and pieces on how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna put them online? What would be the best workflow? Catherine Freeman, Associate Professor Catherine Freeman is an archeologist at ANU and she's a greatly awarded um, teacher or um, faculty member. So she was more into the side of the education part of the project on how are we gonna, how are we gonna include these models and this project into the student experience? And then as I said, we have Rene, that was our research assistant and the person that was creating a lot of these models indeed. The main aims of our project were to increase the accessibility of teaching resources, as I was explaining before. So the access to, to these two archeological collections we have at ANU, but also to improve the skills that graduate students will get on, will get while, when they finish their studies at ANU. And this will be really helpful for either, for, for both, to archaeology and digital humanities, humanities students. And I thought, we thought it was really interesting to kind of merge both disciplines to see what to archaeology can say to digital humanities, if you want to call it like that, and what digital humanities can provide for us. How can we integrate both disciplines as much as possible? But we were also interested in creating an open teaching and research resource for the wider community, for researchers everywhere in the world. And this is a big problem in zoo archaeology. So when we study bones in an archaeological site, we normally find just tiny bits of bone. And then we need to, fi we need to find out to which animal these bones belong. So what we need is this reference collection that we say, or we need books, or you need photos, all these kind of things that sometimes when you are on the field, you are not going to be able to access. So the idea was, well, if we can create a digital catalog where you can download all these models and have them in your computer, hard drive, your phone, wherever you can, you want to have them, and they are high quality, this will provide researchers a way of checking these bones and of also just to visualize no, the bones and see how a kangaroo is different to a coyote, for example. So Scalbo became a reality. So between Katrina and Terry, our digital humanities specialist, and Kate and me, 
we start to produce or to test how are we going to produce these 3D models. So to test the workflow we wanted to implement. So first we experimented with a surface light scanner that is housed at the Digital Humanities Laboratory at ANU. And the results were quite good, as you might see a bit of it on the images, but they were not as accurate as I was wishing for and as good as we would like to. So some of the main issues we had was problems with how bright the models were. And that's a, a very common issue when you are scanning bones because as they are well, quite reflective, they are white, you will always have this problem with light scanners that they just reflect the light and the model you get is a bit not very good. It's just too dark or that actually doesn't reflect the proper anatomy of the bone or the morphology of the bone. Another issue we encountered was accessing the scanner and the software for students because of the way it was, and, and this is before COVID and, you know, craziness with spaces and those things and um, physical distancing. The problem we had is because the scanner and the software, the software is in a single computer and the scanner is in a specific room. And you could only have one small team of people working at a time. So this won't work if we want students to get really getting very efficient on producing these 3D models and, and have the possibility of you know, trying different scanners and using the scanner for a long time. So we came, with a, we came up with the question of how are we gonna be able to develop a more efficient and a structured workflow for our project. So we decided that the best option will be to let the students decide which workflow they would like or which techniques they would like to use for digitizing these specimens. So what we did was we integrated Scalbook into one of the courses that the Faculty of Digital Humanities teaches at ANU. So the course is called Digital Humanities and Public Culture. And I have to say the integration was absolutely fantastic. In this course, Katrina and Terry, what they do is they promote the students' engagement by making them the main actors in the decision-making process. So students are given an object, so in this case, skulls, and they need to decide how they are gonna digitize these elements. So during the semester, they need to pitch the project and develop a project plan, then create a prototype for user testing, and then develop the final digital project that will come with a report explaining the challenges, you know, the strength of their workflow, what problems do they have, and how they, how they work around them. To introduce the students to, to this assignment, Catherine and me, we went to talk to them and we had an extended seminar talking about bones with the students. And it was actually something really interesting because I never thought that some people won't be a bit, I don't know, uncomfortable on, on handling animal skulls. So that was something that we didn't consider at the beginning and then we found out. So over the course of their project, each of the students group developed a unique process for scanning and reproducing the skulls. And some of them use a combination of photogrammetry and scanning. Some of the people use 3D modeling from scratch, from mainly photos, or even just modeling the, the, the skull in this case, or using just light scanner or photogrammetry. So some of these processes were very efficient, some of them were not, and they produce results of variable utility for archeologists. None of the scans as they were produced by an expert people, let's say they, are, they were not zoo archeologists. They were not really suitable for researchers in zoo archeology, span but they were really good for dissemination and for 3D printing. So that was a great strength because that would mean all these models could be used for outreach. So I just wanna show you a small video of when we were scanning one of the, the thylacine skeletons that is still not online and this one here is just a short video of manipulating one of these models. In this case, it's an echidna skull that is really weird. And when you zoom in, you can see actually how accurate it is. Like you can see the tiny shutters in the skull, all these really tiny details that for zoo archeologists is something really basic that we need to look at. So at the end of all this process with the students, we got the most successful student, the one that produced the better workflow or the most um, efficient, that was our colleague, Rene Dixon, and we contract her as a research assistant for the project. So we gave her the task of producing 
all these 3D models that could be uploaded to our Sketchfab um, site. That is, you have the link here on the slide, and if you Google it, you will be uh, seeing it easily. But Scalbook didn't finish in 2018. So funny enough, in 2020, when all the COVID pandemic happened, I was teaching a course in vertebrate remains, in bones. And I had the issue of students, obviously, not being able to come to the university and to access any of these bones. They had, in the course, they had to study anatomy of animals. So obviously, it was basic that they had to touch bones and, and look at them and you know, do all this study. So what I did was, well, I had to continue working on a skull book. So we moved from only a skull, so from only the cranium of the animals, to include some other bones. So I would create some 3D models in my living room, because that's what the space I had at the time. And I think it also showed how easy it was, I mean, quite time consuming, but how easy it was to actually create some of these models. Another of the outcomes we got from Scalbook and we still work on is creating some learning resources for the National Museum of Australia. So if you go into their website and you go to the digital classroom resources, you will see a cranium and a mandible, a jaw from a thylacine, from a Tasmanian tiger. And you have some annotations and you can play with the models and this type of things. So at the end, as a conclusion, a Scalbook is just one of these examples of a successful digitizing project in Sioux archaeological collections. So it produced massive students' engagement and students were really keen on trying, you know, at the beginning they were, as I said, a bit unsecure about how to handle the skulls, but at the end they were actually really into it. And they really appreciate having these remote learning resources because they can look at the skulls from their house. I'm talking about Sioux archaeology students, not that not as many digital humanities students. Also having these models available for download and also for printing. We had people from, I think, United States, UK, that they have printed in their own skulls and they have them there. They, some of them are extremely anatomically accurate. They are really good for researchers and I, was really, really happy to see how well some of them came out. We have now over 12,000 views for the last time we checked and multiple downloads of the models. And I invite all of you to check on them and you know download them if you want and print them at home. And another outcome we got from the project is how good it was to develop these independent projects with open tasks. So instead of giving students Kind of a guideline of what they have to do, giving them the opportunity to decide how they want to do a specific project. So students were really, obviously at the beginning it's a bit daunting to, to have to come up with the idea, but at the end they were really keen on it. And the freedom to find their way to explore the different techniques, experiment with them, fail, and then revise them and see which will be the best solution for their problem, right, for their project. And it also promotes a lot of engagement and critical thinking skills for these students. So thank you everyone for listening. I just want to show you really quickly because I think I have one minute left. And if I can do it. Yep. All right, it's not too bad. So this is our Sketchfab. Oh, Wait. Sophia, we can still yes. see your PowerPoint. So you, you? might need okay. to reshare Stop your screen and, on the yep. browser. Stop. Yep. We've got time, that's fine. That's better, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Great, yep. thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is our site on Sketchfab. So as you can see, and there are still some bones that have to be uploaded, but I have to do that. But you can click on any of them and have a play with them. Look at the different models. Most of them are done with photogrammetry. As if, if any of you have any question about photogrammetry, I'm happy to talk about it later on in the questions. Of course, it always takes a bit of time when you're trying to do these things quick. There you go. Uh, yeah, it, they are obviously you know, fully interactive. You can play with them, zoom in, zoom out, move them and all kind of things you want to do. And just quick, quickly, I want to show you the one we created, I think is this one.
where we actually included some annotations for the National Museum of Australia. So it was the idea was to share it with primary and, and I think it was mainly primary school students. So really basic annotations on what is a thylacine or a Tasmanian tiger, why is different to a dog, why it is a marsupial, all these type of things. I'm obviously not gonna load now. Oh, there it is. But you can click on all of them and it tells you, you know, really basic information about what these animals are. So as I said, I encourage you to, to have a play with it and to give us any feedback and let us know about your projects and how we can help you if, if you need any help and it's anything to do with kind of bones being digitized. And thank you, thank you so much. That's so great. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was so interesting. Um, I mentioned to our uh, speakers before, I previously worked in a natural history museum in digitization. So there are so many rabbit holes. I feel like I could go down with questions in that area. Um, even just that opportunity to try different types of digitization through the student projects and compare the results and the utility of the results. And even, and I love that um, idea of that work, that student project. It's really self-directed project in the pathway to Renee being a research assistant. That's such a great opportunity for students. So thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. Um, with that, I might now introduce our second speaker, who is John Rusiak from the Growing Data Foundation. John has 20 years ICT experience in private governmental and NGO sectors. And he says he started the world's 12th internet campaign, which I love as a fact, um, and co-founded the Things Network Adelaide. John has a long history of innovation in online operations in public and private sectors and has a particular interest in using technology to solve conservation problems. Um, today, he's joining us to talk about the Foundation's CoLab Digital Cultural Fellowship. And CoLab was an initiative or is an initiative of the History Trust, South Australian Museum, State Library South Australia and Art Gallery South Australia to give new opportunities to use digitised content from those collections and helping us all think about them in new ways. And with that, I will pass you over to John. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that. Um, I'm also uh, acknowledging we're on Ghana country and all this, this application was developed on Ghana country. Um, as you find out later on, there's actually a welcome to country contained within the application as well. So just a little bit about um, what I'll do is I'll share my screen. Here we go. Okay. So, this about the middle of 2020, um, the Growing Data Foundation, who is a non for profit organization, applied for and won the fellowship, the first uh, CoLab fellowship, which gave us the opportunity to get access to the digital collections of all the CoLab partners. Um, for those not in um, uh, South Australia, the, the uh, North Terrace in Adelaide is a really unique sort of. Um, uh, cultural precinct, it contains the art gallery, the museum, the state library, um, the Botanic Gardens, the South Australian History Trust, all along one um, fairly wide boulevard. It's um, quite unique um, place in the, in, in the world. And of course, Adelaide University is also on North Terrace, as you will know as well. Um, I'm just run through quickly a couple of things about the GDF. Um, we're a not-for-profit. We've got a triple bottom line sort of um, outlook on our projects. We're a collection of uh, storytellers and um, uh, digital um, experts. Um, and we've got a long history of, well, long history <laughs> in the digital world, a, a fairly short history, but um, history of national and international GovHack sort of successes coming up with sort of innovative new projects with a focus on open data and ecotech. So the CoLab, as um, Alexis, uh, Alex has mentioned, is a, um, uh, uh, an attempt by the partner organizations um, listed here um, to unlock their digital archives. And what we proposed was a, um, uh, what we proposed was an application to, uh, around the theme. So we said that what we might do was to um, rather because there's so much content contained within all these digital archives that what we do is we'd pick a theme and the theme that we picked was um, uh, one of the Murray River um, or for those outside of 
South Australia, the River Murray. So it's the same thing, just in case you were wondering. But um, the, the Murray River was chosen because we, we needed, firstly, we needed a focus for the project. You can't just have everything being, um, uh, every, everything contained within the uh, institutions out there. So the, folk, the, the, the theme of the Murray River was chosen as a focus. The Murray River is very important to Adelaide. Um, uh, we get 70% of our water from, from the Murray River. It's, it's real, a real physical economic connection with that um, Adelaide people have with the river. Um, and of course, stories about rivers are stories about people, the stories about um, geography, geology, economy, the stories about climate change, social history, and pre-settlement Indigenous history, of course, as well. Once we'd chosen the theme, we, we then proposed that um, our digital exemplar that we're delivering as part of the project should be audio based. There's a few reasons for that. Of course, audio is a very low cost medium um, and delivery platform, and it's really accessible. And I think the rise of the podcast um, has really popularized um, uh, the focus that an audio story can give you. So it's very accessible. Um, especially um, it, it, it's small file sizes, they're, they're easy to download and 90% of people know how to um, uh, are au fait with the idea of, of sitting down listening um, to, to snippets of audio, to stories, to podcasts. I'll just go back one slide. Oh, here we go. So what the Echoes platform is. So we decided to deliver this content on this thing called the Echoes platform. What the Echoes platform is, is it's immersive audio um, augmented reality experiences. And basically what it is, is a, it's an application that is geo um, referenced audio content. So as you walk around a set area, you walk into Echoes. So um, the, the content creator will draw a circle on a map, um, put an audio file in that circle. And as you physically walk through that, circle the audio starts playing so then you have a direct connection between the story and the place so this can be all sorts of there's all sorts of obviously interesting um, uses for this guided tours is one that comes to mind as you walk along um, an area and because all of the cultural institutions are uh, along north terrace we saw it as a great opportunity to make a connection between the outside with audio directing people inside into the institutions to go and have a look at artifacts that are being talked about inside the echoes. So it might be an idea just to have a, a quick look about what types of audio are inside the application. So there's a welcome to country from Tamaru, a Ghana elder. Um, another audio story might be, and when we're talking about audio, we're talking about sort of engaging one minute to two minute to three minute um, audio stories talking about the artifacts inside the cultural institutions. Could be a short description of an artifact. It could be a snippet of water facts or science. It could be um, uh, a reading from a diary or a journal. It could be frog or bird calls. So frogs and birds connected with the river, animal sounds. So bringing that Murray River um, biosphere into North Terrace and talking about that connection. It's not just the water that's connecting, it's the stories that are connecting. And we also did some data sonification as well. So data sonification is, is the uh, emerging um, practice of, of um, uh, displaying audio, uh, displaying data as audio sound files. So there's been some really interesting work around how to um, Obviously, visualization of data is a great way of looking at um, complex data, um, big data sets. But another way of doing that is to um, sonify the data as well so that you can hear trends, you can hear different things, you can associate um, different sounds with different um, data sets and data or columns in data sets. I just have, this is the application. So we, we've worked with the developers on in, well, the developers are actually in London. So this is quite a popular platform and we've been engaged with them for a couple of years now, sort of helping them develop as we developed our app as well, because we do have some technical um, background. 
So basically, <coughs> the, app, the um, app itself is free. So if you wanted to go and listen to the audio that we've put on North Terrace, all you need to do is download the Echoes app, uh, put on a set, ideally have um, some headphones and just wander around North Terrace. And you can see here on the slide on the right, these circles represent different sound files. So as you walk into that, say outside the South Australian Museum, um, there's a number of different audio things as well. So you get feedback as you look at the app, it'll tell you what, you look, what you're hearing and it'll give you some metadata around that and perhaps links to more information inside that application. So it's really about telling stories in place. For example, here you can see a cluster of four overlapping echoes on the right there. And these are all frog sounds. So you can imagine as you walk around into one circle, you can hear a frog. You can uh, then go clockwise around those, those other circles to hear other frogs. But if you go into the middle where all the um, uh, circles overlap, you get the chorus of frog sounds. So as you, as you walk around, you get all these interesting plays on sound. So that's a very simple one. It's a demonstration of overlapping sounds and overlapping voices. Um, it's a Venn diagram of frog sounds. This is, this is quite a simple um, interface. So you add your, um, you draw a circle on a map and then you upload the file that you want to play when people go inside that circle. So these are the sorts of things that we have inside the um, digital exemplar, which we delivered as part of the fellowship. Um, we have indigenous stories, we have um, guided tours and walks. Um, and these are things that we want to build on as well. So um, it, it really, to us, it, it, it's a really effective way to um, bring audio into country. So not only can you have a description about an artifact inside the museum, but you can also put that description back on country where it came from. So we're really quite excited about drawing connections between artifacts with inside institutions and their origins and where they came from. So you can take that story back to the land as well. There's nothing, there's no geographical um, limitations as to um, the spread of the echoes. So you can have them as big or as small as you want. You can replicate them everywhere. Um, and you, like I said, and you can build your guided tours or your teaching resources around um, the way that you guide people through different sorts of audio stories. Um, upcoming as well is, is directional audio, which is a really quite an interesting thing. So not only um, with new technology, the new um, uh, advanced headphones that um, Apple and I now think Google are starting to sell. So you can actually have directional audio. So you can imagine yourself outside looking towards a particular object and hearing a story about that object and then just simply turning your head and hearing another story or the same story from a different point of view. So that's an upcoming uh, feature of the um, application. It's already got spatial audio as well. So you can just download the Echoes app and go for a walk down North Terrace, as I said. So, you know, Google or Apple, and we can provide those links if you want to go and explore um, very close to the university. Um, yeah, thank you. That's great. Thanks, John. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm totally going to do it, especially given that it's right at the front of my workplace. There shouldn't yeah. be any, any problem, any challenges to me actually participating in that. Yeah. Um, but so interesting. Can I just invite Sophia to come back on the screen as well and just um, invite our audience if they have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Oh, I'm so pleased to see a chat a message in the chat. It was lovely. And thank you. But uh, as I mentioned at the last, last webinar, we forgot to turn the chat on and we're quite sad when no one asked any questions. Um, so, no, that all sounds really interesting. I just, um, I find these two projects really interesting because they're kind of complementary on two sides of the same challenge. And one is about using the data that, or the, the digitised collections as they come out. And one is about creating those digitised collections. And as someone who has a little bit of a background in digitising collections, I love this appreciation that when you say digitising something, it can mean a bunch of different things. You know, it's not a, someone will say, oh, it's going to digitise the collections. And that can mean 
data about the objects, it can be photographs of the objects, it can be audio, it can be, you know, three-dimensional manipulatable sort of figures. Um, and I just sort of might ask you each a question on that sort of front. Like, um, John, perhaps starting with that user perspective, um, did you have any sort of observations or challenges on inhibitors to your project based on the kinds of digitized collections that you had? And, and did you have sort of a, a wish list of what you would rather see or what you or were you pleased with what you found? Um, anything like that? Yeah, I, I just that there's there's challenges dealing with with cultural institutions. There, there that's um, as, as you know, coming from that sector, as, uh, you've done some work in there yourself. There tends to be a bit of gatekeeping going on as well. And it sometimes is difficult for, um, for a project like this, which is really an innovation project that's supposed to come in and, and explore new things. Um, it, it, sometimes it's hard to get the attention and the time because people are being paid to do a job. They're not, and it's, they, they, the job descriptions haven't changed. They, they still have to do all that job and then they still have to come and see you. COVID was a challenge as well. I, but I think the, the interesting thing that really stuck out for me, and that, that's fine, and we just thought, look, we've been asked to deliver an exemplar. We think we've got a really good story, and we think the technology is really interesting, especially for Indigenous stories, I think, to be able to take those artefacts from outside the museum and the State Library and the History Trust and really replicate them in audio form, put them back on country as well. So it, it really goes some way to sort of that sort of repatriation and things like that. But what I found really interesting was, and I don't know why it surprised me, was that um, a lot of what the institutions thought was digitizing collections was actually just putting their catalogs online, which is nice, but it doesn't actually give you what I think um, that these sorts of generations that are upcoming expect, which is to see the digital twin, which Sophie is, um, has, is talking about, rather than just saying, well, here's the catalog number. And you're looking at it going, well, I found it, but I haven't really found anything. <laughs> so yeah. so it's that, I think that's the, that's the real interesting part to me. And, and, and it goes to what, are, what, what is a digital twin? Um, uh, is the metadata um, more important than the digital twin? Is the metadata um, reflecting somebody's bias in the way that's been catalogued? So all these other sorts of things to me came out of the, um, uh, out of the exercise. The other thing is federated search. How do you search across all the institutions at once? If you were looking for, like we were, we were looking for a theme. We wanted to build a story from all the different cultural institutions, but there's really no way to, to build a federated search easily. Well, it certainly wasn't um, the budget that we had to do it. So federated search, what is metadata? Um, what are the uh, are, are other people who are holding not holding back information, but are they being like gatekeepers? So all these sorts of interesting uh, um, observations. Yeah. Thanks, John. So Vita, you mentioned how the different projects that people did had different usefulness, different degrees of usefulness. Some for outreach, some for scientific identification. Did you have any comments on that approach? What you learned about the different kinds of approaches you can do in that kind of digitization or that three D modeling? Yeah, I absolutely agree with what John just said. I find really interesting with mainly museum, that is the type of cultural institutions I work with. When you approach some museums about digitization, it's exactly what John was saying. It's this idea of that means you're going to put my photos on the website. It's like, no, no, no. That's one thing that, that means, yeah, that's a digital object. But what does that mean? Like what, what information is giving me? And then you have the other way around, like, some people or some institutions were a bit reticent on, on letting us scan or you know, photogrammetry, whatever, creating a 3D model of their specimens because they said, oh, the researchers just come to our institution. We don't need to create this. And I said, well, it's not for those researchers that are coming to your institution, that they will still come. It's not like they are gonna stop coming because now we have a digital object. It's for all of them that don't have access to this, that they cannot come, that they don't have the time. And then I think COVID was a bit helpful in that space and the sense of kind of gave people the view of, okay, we need to make our resources accessible because what happens if people don't come? Well, what do we do, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think I really agree with, with you on that. And, and then on, on your question, yeah, it was, it was a really interesting, it was really interesting to see the workflow that the students were designing and how, you know, having discussions with them on, 
yes, you have created a really nice looking model, but it doesn't have the color of the bone. And they were like, well, why does it matter? It's like, well, it does matter for someone that is looking at this specific thing, at this specific feature on the cranium. If you want to do an event on a museum or on a, I don't know, any kind of institution, it doesn't really matter that much because it's more for people to touch things. And you want a replica because you don't want them to touch the real bone, right? Especially when you are dealing with kids that we all know how clumsy they can be, unless my kids, they are really clumsy. <laughs> and I think it was really interesting to speak because we didn't, you know, you design your project and you have your idea and then you go to the users or the, I would say the, the, the people that are going to interact with this project and they give you all these questions and all this feedback. I, hear, oh, I haven't think about that. I haven't think that because the model I created is not good for us who archaeologists, let's say, it's actually good for outreach. And that doesn't matter. It's still a good product and it's still valuable. So yeah, it, it was really, really interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's me, yeah, you're, every, every side of the equation means something through that interaction as well, you know, so um, that's great. I think that, um, oh, actually, I've got a, a question in the chat window. Emily actually preempted the next thing I was thinking about asking you about, John. <laughs> and I see, John, you have answered, but actually, it's only gone to us, the hosts and panelists. Um, Echoes, it says, Emily has asked, do you think Echoes could be used to link small areas within a building? And that's it. Looking at the map, I know those buildings quite well. And I also know there's lovely paintings of the River Murray inside the art gallery. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, could, could this tour extend inside the buildings? Um, would you mind sharing on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah to, to do that, you just, um, uh, there's a version of the application that uses Bluetooth beacons. So you can have indoor beacons and trigger events like that. Now, Bluetooth location has got a very interesting story over the last five or six years about, um, and it, it started with Apple um, trying to bake it into their operating system so that they wanted to have geolocated content Basically, so you could be walking down outside a shop and the shop tells you that, hey, come in, there's a, there's a special on you. Can, or we'll give you a free coffee if you come in now. And that didn't actually um, eventuate. Um, uh, so that was an iBeacon um, initiative from Apple iOS and Google's iteration was called um, Eddystone. And unfortunately, because of all the backlash, they really pulled the plug and they really set back geolocated content a long way which means that you have to use applications like that and specifically have to give the application permission to you know, have your location because that's what the point of the whole thing is, is for the location. As far as Bluetooth goes and indoor positioning, it's, um, it's, it's still quite difficult to do. Um, uh, it, it's, and unless you are using Bluetooth beacons, it's very hard to approximate the floor plan without having GPS. Um, there are some advanced Wi-Fi technologies which can do it, but they're not at the level of um, where we can access that sort of data really well. So I, I've always, um, at the moment, um, it's, it would be a combination of prompts, um, QR codes as well, so that you can have the application giving more rich content via a QR code and delivering that over the institution's sort of Wi-Fi network. So you don't have to worry about connections, which is sometimes a problem inside these big stone buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so a big combination to do something like, I think what Emily's suggesting would be a um, combination of different technologies and some prompts with QR codes, as well as Bluetooth beacons. Yeah. Big, big 19th century stone buildings as well. Yeah, it's, it's very thick walls. So yes. I've got the radio waves. No, that's right. Very safe. <laughs> very safe. <That's... laughs> yeah. um, I think something you talked about the accessibility of the bones that you created through Spellbook for um, people who are remote from the collections. Um, but also, one of the things that I detected in your project was this collaboration between the zoo archaeologists and the digital humanities people, and it's something that I, it's, it, I sense that you found that quite a rewarding experience. And did that open you up to more ideas of how these bones could be used in teaching outside of um, zoo archaeology as well? Absolutely. It was such a, I mean, we became friends after our project, <laughs> and I think that's the best, you know, kind of <laughs> the best outcome you can have for a project, still being friends. <laughs> after, <laughs> after finishing a project, right? Yeah, yeah it, it was fascinating. It, it was just, I found, because I'm, my background, right? I come from Spain. I don't think, I mean, I'm probably wrong now because I've been 
here in Australia for eight years now, but I don't think digital humanities is really big in Spain at all. So I actually didn't know anything about digital humanities. And I was like, well, what's, this? what's this? So I think the first conversation we had was, what is it, digital humanities? And of course that went, explode into oh I didn't know any of this and and of course you always make the oh so that means digitizing things no and and it was really interesting to learn about this discipline that I didn't know before and to learn of all the possibilities that it can provide to archaeology or any kind of social sciences or you know pure science if you want to call it like that and I, I just find yeah I, I mean it's, it's not because you, know, you are for digital humanities, but I just find that it's such a good discipline in terms of building students' skills. It brings so many different uh, skills or so many different kind of abilities to students. But at one point we were like, well, every student should have a digital humanities course. And, you know, because it just gives you this idea on, okay, you can do computer sciences and visualization and then thinking about the workflow and thinking about metadata that is something that people don't consider right that i see that a lot in your archaeological collections you have bones that have been collected somewhere and there is no information about the bone so well, I, that is not really really useful if i don't have any of that information so i find it amazing in the sense of learning about it and then actually interacting with the students and with the faculty members, it was so enriching of learning. And I, I think they also, it, it was fun to, you know, show them the skulls and because I've been doing it for so long, I can see clearly that, okay, this is a dog looking thing. It was a coyote, this is a kangaroo, it's a herbivore. And they were like, how do you know? It's like, they are so different, right? But, and it also makes you think like, okay, why do I think it is different? What yeah. can I explain to people? What is the difference is to know you know, really basic bone identification. And so, yeah, it was a really, really enriching and great collaboration in any sense, in all the senses. Yeah, the comment you made about what is digital humanities, um, it is such a contested or a, a discussed topic that there's a Twitter account that has, a, I think it's DH Defined, that spurts out a definition of what is digital humanities every hour. It's yeah, right. <laughs> It's many things. Um, and I think you're right. I think that there is a great benefit in studying digital humanities. It's a difficult sell to someone who's taking on their study path and that kind of thing. But as you've spoken about that process of digital project design, mm. um, no matter what the subject is, you know, that, you know, today it's bone identification. Tomorrow, you know, I've, I've seen projects coming out of University of Queensland around historical dress archives from notable Australian designers. These are all sorts of ways of um, tackling a topic, providing new ways of looking at it, and, and even just that, that project mm -hmm. management, that workflow design, that thinking about all of the inputs and so many wide applications. Uh, absolutely. So the, the course where we were using the students, if you want to say it, mm -hmm. to do the, the bone models, that course has been running, obviously, since 2017, that we, was 2017, I think, yep. Yeah. And each year they do something different. So they did some more like, I think it was like Greek artifacts from the classical museum here at Ainu. But last year they were actually doing some of the some of the things they could find on the campus, for example. So some students did scar trees and they did these 3D models of scar trees. Some other students did buildings because they were interested in the buildings. Some of them did just like a map. Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting to see the same. Like they it is the same thought process but how the results are completely different. And obviously the challenges you're gonna have if you are digitizing a building compared yeah. if you're digitizing something that is like handheld, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, Ellen's made a comment in the chat. It's not really a question for a comment, but the public access that's being granted to these collections is so interesting when so much of institutional collections is behind a paywall or geographic advantage. And that's the thing, every one of these, our own, the University of Adelaide Library has vast collections that are, not put on display that are you know inaccessible except for research purposes essentially and it's not that we don't want to keep people from accessing it's just the practicalities of getting access to these things you know we keep them protected usually for conservation reasons but we want everybody to see them um john yeah. i think your project definitely is you know giving people mm -hmm. access to collections that they might not otherwise associate with say a visit to the museum or a visit to the state library yeah, um, yeah. is that the accurate well, in a way, and in a way, no, because there's there's the it's it's interesting, isn't it? Like you look at say a book, 
and it's got a copyright and the copyright lapses and then you can go and get it on the Gutenberg library mm -hmm. site or, or whatever. So is that going to happen with digital twin? Is it going to happen that, you know, as this technology becomes more ubiquitous and people can do more scanning, like um, Sophia mentioned photometry, um, which is just basically making a model of things, taking photos with your, with your camera phone. So anyone can do this. It's just not embedded in um, visible. We're going to have more and more content sort of, and it's going to really raise some of these questions about paywalls and things like that up to the fore, but also question the, um, uh, some of the assumptions that some of these institutions have about their own collections and holding those collections. Of course, there are culturally sensitive information that is not going to be made available. And, but when it's, um, uh, and, and of course, there is also things that are, um, you know, uh, sensitive to environmental changes and things like that. But that's where the digital should start, you know, at, at that level, you know. Um, uh, it, and with the cultural stuff, it's very easy to say yes or no. And with the with the environmentally sensitive things, say you know, for example, a book that really shouldn't be outside of a clean room, you can you can go inside the clean room, you can make the copy, you can do all those sorts of things. So it's going to be a very interesting time over the next ten to fifteen years as the technology advances and people get more and more used to the idea of of making digital uh, representations of things that are not just text or photographs. So. Um, this is going to be a very interesting and challenging time for some of these institutions and teachers as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I think one of the challenges that is really here, and I think your project to a degree I'm really excited about, John, because it's really building those kind of connections between different types of collections because mm. we have, you know, in the, in the early stages of digitisation of collections, museums may digitise for one purpose, libraries might digitise for their own purpose, and it's the interoperability between these things where things can get very exciting. And I feel so, but I also think that sometimes the technical challenge yeah. and even the institutional challenge, the licensing in a way, the formatting yeah. content in a way that these things can be joined together. Um, you may be aware there's a one of the very big digital humanities projects um, is in Europe called the Venice Time Machine. And that's, I was thinking about it when Sophia was talking about buildings, like what they're doing in a way is they've got this incredible archive of the history of Venice and sort of linking the physical space and then the digitised buildings, the past buildings that were in that space with the archival records and the people records that were associated with them. And really the excitement there is when you can get those collections to sort of overlay over the top of each other as well, which is something which is, only possible well really good really good exhibitions can do that too um but is a possible on a whole other dimension when you're talking about digital yeah. that's interesting well. because venice is you could you could probably suggest that venice is faced with an existential threat of climate change and if you don't digitize <laughs> it's going to go under the way so that might be one of the drivers behind I don't, I don't know enough about why it was funded, but I'm <laughs> sure that that was put in some sort of grant application. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and that's the other thing, capturing change over time as well. So, yeah. yeah. One of the, um, yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the, uh, the um, real inspirations behind it was um, uh, the British Museum's uh, History of the World in 100 Objects, which is a fantastic sort of, um, uh, where they focus on an artefact but they tell stories from different perspectives. So they might be holding an artifact that's, um, you know, whatever the artifact is, but talking about it from a sort of a social aspect rather than just, you know, a purely scientific aspect. So to have different experts from different institutions talking about uh, artifacts and using the artifact as a story, as a basis for telling a story is a great way to start the conversation around ownership and about gatekeeping and about um, you know wider impact of, of, of things. So um, we really like that history of the world and hundred objects because of that aspect. You know, find a find a focus thing. It could be you know it could be a bone or a skull, and then what stories can you tell around it to get people engaged in that story? Yeah. Um, and it, it's not necessarily the expert. It, it could be other people's opinions about different things. It could be all sorts. That's, of things. Yeah. Who is yeah? An expert is an expert in one. One aspect of it. So it's a, and there's um, lovely opportunities like that to see different kinds of expertise. Yes. I actually, um, just to plug, uh, Stuff the British Stole on ABC IV, yeah. I believe it might even be starting tonight. Um, there was a podcast, two series, of, a podcast series about that, and um, now it's turned into a television series. Exactly that is what I loved about it. So a single yeah. object 
and it's the different cultural perspectives, you know, from yeah. the historian, the British historian, and the, the, the yeah. sort of the country from which it, it came and that kind of thing. Anyway, we are very close to the end of our time today. I could talk about this stuff for hours. <laughs> so um, I've had a best wind us up. Um, thank you so much, John and Sophia, for your presentations today. They were both very, very thank interesting. You. And to Matt, who's been very um, helpfully supporting us behind the scenes. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is the final Digital Humanities Lab session for the year, and um, I personally have really enjoyed all of our presentations that we've had. Um, I'm actually just going to pop the YouTube link in the window here. If you are interested, please feel free to visit the University of Adelaide YouTube page, and all of our past sessions are on there. I will send that out to all of our registrants as well when I send the recording of this video. Um, so, and indeed all the sessions from 2021 are there as well. So I hope that the 2022 winds up very well for all of you. It does feel slightly early in the year to be saying that, but it is, uh, it's fast approaching. Um, and I look forward to seeing, uh, uh, seeing you join us in 2023. So thank you very much to everyone and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. See ya. Bye-bye.